Bullseye with Jesse Thorne is a production of MaximumFun.org and is distributed by NPR. It's Bullseye. It's Bullseye. I'm Shireen Marisol Meraji, in for Jesse Thorne. I open all my interviews by having my guests describe themselves. So it's only fair that I do the same. I'm Puerto Rican and Iranian. I was born and raised in California. I love Bay Area hip hop, and my favorite book is Anne of Green Gables, Still, after many, 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 many years. <laughs> I also host NPR's Code Switch podcast. On the podcast, we discuss race, culture and identity in the United States. And I'm going to bring a little bit of that sabor, a little bit of that flavor to the show today. So let's get to it. My guest this week is Garcia. They play Jake Rodriguez in Tales of the City on Netflix. It's an update to an LGBT classic you may remember from PBS in the 90s. Actors Laura Linney and Olympia Dukakis were in it back then, and they're back for this one too. Tales of the City first appeared as a newspaper column written by Armistead Maupin. Then it evolved into a series of novels and worked its way onto the small screen. And this Netflix version follows people who live at 28 Barbary Lane in San Francisco. And they're from a bunch of different racial and ethnic backgrounds now. And like on the original, they're queer, straight, old, young, all looking for belonging and a place to call home. In the show, Jake Rodriguez is a trans man in a relationship with his lesbian girlfriend, Margot. Jake's a few years into his transition and is in the midst of trying to make sense of his new life. Margot's figuring it all out, too. She loves Jake, but she signed up for a lesbian relationship. And in this scene, Jake and Margot are back home after a baby's gender reveal party. And Margot's a little annoyed that Jake's mom is all about them as a couple now that Jake has transitioned. She breaks a hundred trans rules every time she texts me. You know better than to be upset about what my mom said. I'm not upset. It's just the idea of being one half of a mom and dad. So gross. I think you're overthinking it. Or are you underthinking it? Margo. You can't seriously expect me to be a mommy in Lululemon yoga gear with her gender-revealed baby waiting for daddy to drive us to straight people glitter parties, right? Of course not. Daddy would drive you to gay people glitter parties. How would you describe yourself to someone who's never met you? Okay, uh, I'm Garcia, diehard Chicagoan, uh, Southside forever. Shout out to Southside if they hear this. <laughs> I don't know. I I have no idea. I think that's like always my immediate terrible response is like, I don't know. We're so, I'm like, I'm always, and I think that's just because like, if I may, like I'm always trying to figure myself out mm. and like always growing and learning. And like, I think that like, it's hard always like to pinpoint myself to like, I mean, I'm a writer, I'm a poet. I guess I can act. I don't know. I, <laughs> like, Why just uh, Garcia? Uh, you know, last names are gender neutral. Yeah, yeah, it don't raise no questions, you know, they just, it's a last name, so, I mean, I guess you could argue that, like, last names are, like, somewhat masculine, because they come from, like, traditionally our fathers, mm-hmm. right? but, like, that's not, that's not the case in, in my, in my situation, so, like, uh, well, a lot it of, saves a lot of headaches. <laughs> a lot of papers, a lot of articles um, have referred to you as yeah. a trans non-binary actor, yeah. so that's a description that you're getting. Yeah. Does that fit yeah. you? I mean, I, yes, right? If you, like, want to... If people in, in our world today, or, like, always, want to put people into boxes, <laughs> um, yeah, I guess, you know, I, I, I was conflicted when I first, like, had to start identifying, you know, publicly and was like, mm-hmm. well, I mean, yeah, I guess... But, like, if I could, I would just be, like, just queer, mm. just Garcia, you know? Because the queer for me is, like, yeah, it's, like, a sexual identity, or, yeah, a sexual gender identity, but, like, also just... You know, like uh, it's an, it's also I think like for me personally an ambiguous term. Does that make sense? Like no, please please keep yeah. telling me. To, please keep explaining it's, it to me. Because like I think that often, especially within like the queer community, it's like all of these labels and terminologies mm-hmm. and and mad respect. Like I will always call people whatever they want to be called by, however they want to be identified as. Always, you know, and and I because I I expect the same. But I also like want to get away from that. I want to get away from 
from this constantly like need or this constant need to identify to to put a, a name to something or, or a label and so for me although queer is yes still a word it's still a label I think it's just been like the easiest thing throughout my life because I again I never know and I've never adhered to the binary since I was little so like you know growing up and now learning that there's terminology for that it's like all right cool now that I know this I kind of like it's in my back pocket but like let's not use it if we don't have to does that make sense yes it does i mean that kind of gets into the character that you play on this netflix series right tales of the city yes um little description here it's about lgbtq folks and Mm -hmm. allies they live in an apartment complex in san francisco on 28 barbary lane Mm -hmm. and the building's owned by a trans woman named anna madrigal Yes. But her tenants, they're more than tenants. They're like a family. And she's like the matriarch of this family. She's this 90-year-old woman. Or she's just turning 90 Yeah. on the first episode. <laughs> and I was looking for something to watch on Netflix. And I stumbled across this. And I was like, oh, this looks really good. And then I'm digging. And then yeah. it turns out, wait, this has been on TV before. It was on PBS in the right. 90s. And it's based on a series of novels that was published in the late 70s, the first of which I think was published in the late 70s. And I was like, how have I never heard (laughs) of Tales of the City? Had you heard of this? No, no, same, same boat. Oh, you're making me feel so much better. Yeah. (laughs) No, I mean, right, because like, how would you, I mean, personally, unless you knew somebody that also watched it or was like a big fan or, I mean, even like it, it probably wouldn't even come up in conversation, but like. I, I had no idea um, until I got the audition that any of this existed. So immediately, the first time I got the sides, I, I did my research. And I mm-hmm. and then, yeah, finding all this queer history out was so refreshing. And I was kind of glad that I didn't know anything about it because then it was all new to me, right? It was a, a whole new experience from, from Jump. And so learning about it, you know, being, you know, a newspaper column and then books. And then, you know, yeah, it actually went up in the UK first and then came to the US. On, on PBS and so, and then, you know, went up again three more times. And so for this to be like a whole new thing, it, it made me appreciate it a lot more because then it just reaffirmed that this work is being done now, but it, it the, it's only a result of the work that's been in the process or like, you know, been happening way before you and I even were around. Does that make Yeah, It, that it makes does sense. make sense. I mean, you weren't even born, right, when the no. PBS thing came out? <laughs> well, I was born in 95. I came a year later, you know? Uh, <laughs> But still, you were too young to be watching PBS. Even, right, right, right. I mean, unless it was like Sesame Street. Right, exactly, exactly. It was no Tales of the City. <laughs> no. So what I love about Jake's storyline is all of these layers and complexities. Um, and in, in the scene, you and your partner, Margo, you're walking up the steep hill in San Francisco. You've got mm-hmm. this huge sheet cake <laughs> yeah. that you're carrying for Anna Madrigal's 90th birthday. And would, would you mind describing just the beginning of why they get into this very intense conversation yeah. while they're carrying this cake up the hill. Yes, of course. So they're the Margo, Jake and Margo, they're at the the bakery and there's a little girl in there. She's with her mom and Margo interacts with her. She's real sweet and the mom goes, I- I'm waiting for the cake and the mom turns to Margo and she's like, do you, do you two have any kids? And like, I immediately don't interact with that because that's probably, that that's a topic that like that we've had before, but like, you know, it's a touchy topic. Mm-hmm. And then Margo's like, no, not yet, you know? And then the cake comes. And, and so that implies like a bunch of things um, that, that Jake and Margo, you know, it stirs something up inside of Margo and, and Jake is, uh, you know, he picks up on that. So cut to the cake. Let's do <laughs> it. In the hill. She thought we were straight, Jake. So she thought we were straight. You're excited. No, I'm not. You're passing and you're excited. What's wrong with that? I swear to God, if you started on your gender as a construct speech right now, I will throw this cake at you. Look, all I'm saying is we know we're queer. No one's taking that from us. A couple of queers walk down the street and no one knows it. Are they still queer? I was never good at algebra. You're so annoying. Also, gender's definitely a construct. (laughs) <laughs> it's an important scene, but it, there's a there's some humor in it too, mm-hmm. and it's not like oh so deep. Right, it feels like a conversation between a couple where there's a little bit of a wink, and yeah, it's heavy, but it's also light, which I appreciate. Right, 
but it also is like a little i think yes it is light but, but i also think like it's just the surface it's like scratching the surface mm. of all this other stuff that we see jake and margo go through you know yeah because this is just and, the first episode right right <laughs> just the first episode and so right it, in the it's beginning a lot of yeah it's a lot more than that your character jake is mm. i'm gonna throw out a bunch of terms right now yeah yeah <laughs> is latinx Mm -hmm. Jake's trans. Jake's mm -hmm. in a relationship with a woman who misses being in a lesbian relationship. Right. Um, uh, because now she's with a trans man. Mm -hmm. Jake's having feelings for men post transition. There's right. so much going on with this character. There are so many layers. Mm -hmm. Was there a part of the storyline that was the most challenging for you to play? No. Really? <laughs> You're like, I got nah. this. <laughs> no, it's not even that. It was just like, man, I'm, you know, I, you know, I know, I was, I would say like, who was in that writers' room? I mean, I, who, I know who was in the room now because I got to meet him. Yeah. But like, prior to me coming in, like, dang, who was in that writers' room? Who was peeking into my life, writing it for verbatim and like these experiences and like validating things that I had been questioning for years in a script. It wasn't until after the show actually that like I realized how alone I had felt hmm. and like because it was all of a sudden, you know, all these messages from from all these people all over the world, trans non-binary folks reaching out to me telling me how much they resonated with with Jake was so like damn, like so I I mean I knew I wasn't the only person in the world that felt like this, but I didn't know anyone personally that I could connect with on a level where I could talk about these things with and and try to figure it out and, and not feel as alone or or even like I felt like I was losing my mind like you know just yeah. because I had no one to connect to with what which I were basic things in my in my head or I thought you know right like basic relationship issues but it wasn't that it was I had no one around and so it was like this over like a wave of just of 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 hope of of pride of like man I'm I'm actually proud to be who I am even more so because like all these other people exist and they can connect to this character so that means like I yeah I'm not the only one that feels this way and it's just been so nice and and I think the show even has helped me uh, in my own like feeling reassured in in, in my and myself and my body and like what I've been going through over the last what three and a half years or so mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I don't. Sorry, I don't know if that like answered the original question, but it did, and more. <laughs> and um, there's this scene in episode three. Jake's mm -hmm. at his pregnant sister's gender reveal party, mm -hmm. and Jake's Latina mom is super supportive at first. Right? She's calling him mijo instead of mm -hmm. mija. She's not messing up. She's right. like doing all the things. And I was like, wow, go mom. Right. But, <laughs> but <laughs> it's complicated. Right. And I. I was wondering if you could talk about why Jake's mom's reaction was not quite as down as it yeah. seemed at first. Because if you were, I think if you were to ask Jake's mom or any mom that probably is similar to, to Jake's mom in real life, like, they do love their their child, right? Like Yeah. But then she says that, you know, she's talking about, you know, she's happy that, that Margo and I are going to be, that, you know, when we have kids that our children will have a normal mommy and daddy mm -hmm. and like uses that normal mommy and daddy and that just like that hits hard because like one what does normal mean like what what is that you know again and we know what that means that's like another way to say passing oh like a heteronormative like visually like not queer family so like you're safe, you're good, and like that's that's great. I love that, and that'll be great. As opposed to like, and then it makes me question like, well, how was she feeling when I was a lesbian and identified as a lesbian and was dating Margot or, or like however or like whoever else, you know? And and she's like, how, God works in mysterious ways. Yes, yes. So it's like, oh, I don't think she was totally on board with me being a lesbian, you know, at the t you know prior to. So it's tough but in her own way she loves jake but she doesn't love jake in the way that jake needs her to and that's that's when i think that that line of like you know your your chosen family and your biological family comes into play yeah. but that's like a whole nother thing yeah but we're yeah, gonna get to yeah, that don't worry yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so but speaking of biological family did mm. any of that scene feel familiar oh, to you yeah. because of your own experience yeah, and if so most deaf. can you like yeah. share a story with us um I don't know if I have like stories, but like because I, 
I very much am a, the person that practice and preaches like to set boundaries with family. My family's not like in any way like abusive or like um like they don't say crazy sideways but like they definitely don't love me in the ways I need them to, mm -hmm. you know? And so that's tough to be around, you know? They do slip up on prono pronouns and still, you know? And, and they do slip up on like, not names, but they use like old nicknames that still would like kind of like refer to my old name. Like, you know, uh, a lot of that is still there. And like yeah. to them, it's not my old name, so it's okay, <laughs> you know? Like, but so that's, and it's not that, they're dismissive or like they're hating on the on, on who I am now it's just it's tough for them to to get on board and I'm also not around you know I that's a choice that I make to like be around people that like love me for me like I, I totally spend holidays with chosen family and mm -hmm. friends and like it's just and I live out in New York now all my family's like back in Chicago or like parts of California Texas all that stuff but like so I very much have distanced myself in multiple ways and that's just like a personal choice I've made that like for my own sanity, for my own mental, emotional, physical well-being um, that I think a lot of people feel like they can't do. But yeah. I'm just like, nah, you definitely come first. Like you, you know, and, and, and then everything else can follow. Because then if I'm not good, then I can't be good to other people. You know, like I'm sure if I stood around, like I would eventually like, I don't know, gain some sort of like animosity or resentment towards family, you know, and I don't want that. So like. You know, so I, I don't really have stories other than like my family definitely <laughs> tries. So you keep it's your tough. distance. I keep my distance. Yeah, yeah. I love them. I love them from, from far away, <laughs> but I love them. <laughs> what are your preferred pronouns? They, them. They, them. Which is also tough, you know, be coming up from like, uh, you know, my mom's side of the family being Latin. You know, it's just tough, you know, to the Spanish. But, you know, ironically, though, I do have a, a story is that like my grandmother like traditional from Mexico, you know, like accepting so quick, mm. like no questions immediately, like is uses my name, uses masculine pronouns in Spanish, right? Cause it's hard to like, grandma use bi non-binary pronouns in Spanish. Like I don't even know how to do that. You know, <laughs> like right. I'm still practicing. So it's totally cool. She using masculine pronouns, mm. but is using my name and calling me like her grandson and mijo and like, is like basically Jake's mom, but it never says problematic things, like ever, 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 ever. It's like to all love and like, as long as I'm on my best behavior and respecting and doing what I need to do, everything else don't matter to her. Like she'll, so I love that, that my like, my, my grandmother is, is the one that was like the first one on board and has been the entire way. When we return, Garcia shares their anxieties over being pigeonholed in Hollywood. It's Bullseye from MaximumFun.org and NPR. Support for this podcast and the following message come from ZipRecruiter. Hiring used to be hard. Multiple job sites, stacks of resumes. But today, hiring can be easy, and you only have to go to one place to get it done. ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter sends your job to over 100 of the web's leading job boards. Then ZipRecruiter scans thousands of resumes to find the people with the right experience and invite them to apply to your job. Try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash bullseye. The world is complicated, but knowing the past can help us understand it so much better. That's where we come in. I'm Randa Abdel Fattah. I'm Ramtin Arablouei, and we're the hosts of Throughline, NPR's history podcast. Every week, we'll dig into forgotten stories from the moments that shaped our world. Throughline from NPR. Listen and subscribe now. Well, Alexis, we got big news. Uh oh. Season one, done. It's over. Season two, coming at you hot. Three years after. <laughs> three right, season three one. Now. Technically right. almost four years. All right. And now, it, listen, here at Can I Pet Your Dog, the Spanish yes. podcast, our seasons run for three and a half years. <laughs> and then in season two, we come at you with new hot co hosts named you. Hi, I'm Alexis. <laughs> I also am. Uh, field trip. Dog tech. Yeah. Dog news. Dog news. Celebrity guests. Oh, big shots. Will not let them talk about their resume. Nope. Only yeah, the dogs. Only the dogs. I mean, if ever you were going to get into Can I Pet Your Dog. Now's the time. Get in here every Tuesday at MaximumFun.org. It's Bullseye. I'm Shireen Marisol Meraji, in for Jesse Thorne. Joining me is the actor Garcia. Along with Olympia Dukakis and Laura Linney, Garcia's in the new TV series Tales of the City on Netflix. It's just so weird, you know? I'm in this new body, and 
It feels so good to finally look the way I always felt. You're very handsome, Jake. Your character, Jake, works uh, for Anna Madrigal as a caretaker mm -hmm. at 28 Barbary Lane. And Anna's a 90-year-old trans woman. She owns the apartment building, and she's played by Olympia Dukakis. And in this scene that we're about to hear, you know, there's this huge 90th birthday party celebration. It's wrapped up because some cops broke it up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, and at the end of the festivities, Anna's asleep in the courtyard, and Jake takes her back up to her place. And this is the conversation that they have. But the thing is, it's not just my body that's changed. The way the world relates to me is so different. Yes, I remember that part. It's as if the very ground underneath your feet has shifted. It was like this for you, too? Very much. <laughs> After my transition, I lost many people. But I gained a lot more. Mm. See, you can hear it. You can just <laughs> hear just it. I just want to cry. Just uh, listen to that. I'm tearing up. Uh, the way she does it. Ah, oh, man. <laughs> See? Uh, it's so good. It's so good. Yeah, that, that was an excellent scene between the both of you. Mm. Um, and it does get back to what you were saying earlier about chosen family. Yeah. And, you know, Definitely. your chosen family. And do you have a chosen family? Oh, yeah, of course. Everywhere I go, I, mm. you got to find your... You got to find your people, you know? I think that's important just for, like, your mental and emotional stability, but also, like, just for your survival, right? Because you got to be able to get through whatever you're getting through and, with, and without having, like, I think, like, a, a, a support system, you know? You can very much, like, spiral out or fall out, you know? Um, but, yeah, everywhere I go, I, I try to build a, a family of my own. Um, I mean, that's how I came into acting in theater, I like ran into an old high school friend that I had at a train station and then through there he was waiting for like a mentor uh, for the summer program mentor said mentor like invites me along to, to go hang out with them just met this man hmm. and and I go and then like fast forward a month and a half like he invites me to be in his play and mm -hmm. And I was like, I've never touched theater a day in my life or any type of acting and I said yes and then that's how I came to to know the arts and uh, through your chosen family, yeah, and that well, like, and then learning, right? That that chosen family is a thing. Like learning uh, that, like, right. forget friends or best friends. Like that's always nice, but like your family, like the people that are gonna have you no matter what. Like that's that started from from my theater, like a, a non for profit back up in Chicago uh, called Free Street Theater. Mm -hmm. Like that's where I f I found my my people and 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 all these amazing people that are that are working towards the same thing, like a, a better world and and you know and, and and a world of acceptance and and love, but also like rebellion and 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 all that good stuff. So how old were you when when uh, you figured like that out? Seventeen. I okay. was sixteen, seventeen. Yeah. You've said in a few articles. Mm. that you don't want to be pigeonholed into yeah. playing trans characters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but playing a trans character, being non-binary, trans non-binary, and playing a trans character, mm -hmm. that's <laughs> amazing, right, in this day and age, because so often we've heard, oh, there aren't people out there that can do that, and et cetera. Yeah. So this is a really exciting thing. So mm. why are you worried about being pigeonholed. I'm so glad you asked that because because it's a it's like okay, I'm not going to be like a total pessimist and be like we're not going anywhere like we are, right? We are making like and I say we as in like the people in the field specifically like Hollywood they're doing it. They're trying. Mm -hmm. But I read this article on 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 television there's like 800 plus regular actors. Like and regular as in like cis actors, okay? Mm -hmm. There is less than a hundred, it's like eighty, like seventy nine, or right under eighty, like LGBTQ actors. All, t t all total the LGBT yeah, every... and Q. Right <laughs> from the from the community, 80, under 80. there's like under a hundred, you know, and that blew my mind. And it's just like because even if these roles are written, I mean, I'm I am I'm so honored and, and lucky to be able to be like to play exactly who I am. But that's one role. And like over five thousand people auditioned for Jake. 
Wow. Yes. And so when I heard that, I was like, holy I mean, wonderful, wonderful that Tales of the City did that work, right? Because every time I hear people say that, like, oh, we couldn't find such and such, you lie. You lie, you lie, you lie, because you just didn't do the work. You didn't do an open call. You really didn't want to cast. You wanted, like, a big hitter that's already known. You want you your show or your movie to do well or draw attention, so you're going to take the easy way out and cast a celebrity who's most likely cis, who's also most likely hetero, Right. Mm -hmm. And they'll take that spot as opposed to casting authentically. And I, I get that argument about like, oh, well, actors should be able to play. every. Yes, I totally agree. But until everybody is at the table and we both got the same amount of food on our plate. I know these like I'm using these weird metaphors, <laughs> but until we got the same amount of food on our plate, then I don't want to hear about it. You know, like I, trans people are barely, barely like Laverne Cox says she's like one of the like. From Aline, than you yeah, are. yeah, and she like pioneered for us, and then you have Asia K. Dillon, who who's non binary on billionaires, who's also like opening doors for folks. I mean, I don't know if this if this is all off topic, but like I I am glad that I that I was able to play play Jake, but that's one role, and now it's like, all right, well, what else? If we get season two, great, I get to play that role again, but like. I don't want to just play trans roles or non binary roles, like because like that's not. I'm not just my my identity, right? Like I can be so much more than that. And if like they would never look at a cisgendered hetero actor and question, "Oh, can you play this character?" cuz then it would come down to like their actual craft and that would be then question. Unless like, they were a person of color, then then they would Right, question. that too. Right, <laughs> right. Exactly. Like all those marginalized folks like definitely get looked at twice. And wondering, like, ooh, can you play this character? As opposed to, like, looking at our work and our craft and, like, us as actual artists. But also, too, like, my friends and I always talk about, like, well, that just means we got to do the work. Like, that just means that, like... Yourself. I, I, like, yeah, right. Like, Make yes, it yourself. Like, always right. Like, I'm totally for, like, I can't wait for Jane Doe to write my role. And so <laughs> I can't. I can't. And, like, I'm so blessed, right, that Tales exist. Because then I was like, all right, that was also reassurance for me and my work. Because I was like, all right, cool. This work is already being done. It'll open doors for me later. Because then when I bring to some, some nuanced work to the table, it won't be as, like, arbitrary or, like, do you know what I mean? It won't be, like, this big shock. It'll be, like, another piece to this puzzle that we're all trying to put together. Garcia plays Jake Rodriguez on the Netflix series Tales of the City. Garcia, thank you so much for talking to me. Thank you. I I think this was I, no. This definitely was probably one of my favorite. If not, no. Because oh, I hope they keep it in you saying that. This, <laughs> <laughs> you're like just cool to talk to, so I really appreciate that too. Just like that chill environment already off the bat was was nice. Garcia, check them out as Jake Rodriguez in Tales of the City, which is available on Netflix now. And it's totally okay if you haven't read the books or watched the original versions of the show. It's easy to jump right in. And we've come to the end of another episode of Bullseye. Bullseye is produced at MaximumFun.org headquarters overlooking MacArthur Park in beautiful Los Angeles, California. The show is produced by Speaking Into Microphones. Our producer is Kevin Ferguson. He's away taking care of a new baby, so Ragu Manavalan stepped in for him this week. Jesus Ambrosio is our associate producer. We get help from Casey O'Brien. Our production fellow is Jordan Cowling. Our interstitial music is by DJW, also known as Dan Wally. Thanks, Dan, for sharing it with us. Our theme song is Huddle Formation by The Go Team. Thanks to them and their label, Memphis Industries, for letting us use it. And before you go, Bullseye has been around for almost two decades. That means hundreds and hundreds of interviews with some incredible guests. You can check them out on our website. Just go to MaximumFun.org. We're also on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Just search for Bullseye with Jesse Thorne. You can keep up with all our episodes there. And me. You can follow me at Radio Mirage on Twitter or check out NPR's Code Switch podcast. And I guess that's about it. Just remember, all great radio hosts have a signature sign-off. Bullseye with Jesse Thorne is a production of MaximumFun.org and is distributed by NPR.